Hi, y'all. Um, so fake news. Um, at this moment in time, doesn't need an incredible amount of introduction, but misinformation we were just talking about backstage is not something that started with, you know, the current conversations in Washington or the present administration. It's something that you all and a lot of people have been thinking about um, for a long time. Um, and more interesting than, you know, it's troubled journalistic communities, academic communities for a really long time. And I'm interested to hear, do you think average Americans, you know, that interact with news maybe on Twitter or scrolling through Facebook or doing Google searches are actually as preoccupied with fake news as um, those of us in those other communities might be? And, and do they define fake news differently um, than we might? I think that's a, a, a great question. And I think I would say yes, people are concerned with fake news. Now, people have different definitions of fake news. We were uh, talking about this a little bit. I think a lot of people understand it to be things that are fabricated that they see on social media. So things like the Pope endorsed Donald Trump or Barack Obama put himself on the $1 bill. Stuff that's totally fake and those are things that have actually gotten fact checked. Um, but that have the appearance of looking real. And there's a, a large amount of that kind of content on uh, the platforms. But then there's stuff like, it's a report that you didn't like the framing of or that you disagreed with the underlying premise of. Um, our uh, President Donald Trump has defined fake news as coverage he doesn't like. So I think you have this range of of definitions of fake news, but at the end of the day, I think nobody likes to be fooled. And right now, if you go online, there's a certain chance that you're gonna be fooled. Deb, you've studied how misinformation travels on social media, particularly on Twitter. How is, uh, what are the results kind of of your research? What are the conclusions that you've drawn? So we did a study including, uh, which included PolitiFact um, uh, data where we took uh, a collection of stories that had been fact-checked by six different organizations and looked at how they spread on Twitter and traced what we call cascades where someone would uh, tweet uh, about a story and then somewhere in the reply chain we would find a reference to a fact check. Um, and uh, overall, uh, over the course of 10 years, um, we found several million tweets that were propagating stories, some of which turned out to be uh, fact checked as uh, true versus false. And um, there was a, a very clear pattern that false stories tended to uh, spread much further, much faster than, than true stories. Um, so there was just a, a clear uh, bias um, towards essentially false stories winning out uh, if uh, the, uh, the definition of winning is to, to, to reach more people faster. Um, we did a lot of uh, work to figure out what the role of bots were and concluded that this was primarily a human-driven dynamic, not bots. Uh, bots were at play roughly equally across false and true news. Uh, we also looked at the nature of replies to these uh, original stories and found that uh, when you coded for emotion, um, disgust and surprise were the two strongest emotions that correlated with false stories. Uh, so uh, although we can't uh, be certain, it, it seems quite reasonable that there's a, an emotional response in the moment uh, that tends to correlate with the, the veracity of the story that tends to propel those stories forward. Angie, I see you shaking your head. Does that square with your kind of understanding of how false information has spread over your career at PolitiFact? I think it certainly has an emotional aspect to it. People see these things, they think, oh, I, that's so horrible, I can't believe it, I have to share it. I do think some of the virality of false news, though, comes from uh, the conversations that result when people dispute it. So you say something that's true and everyone's like, yeah, okay. It doesn't take the conversation very far. If you say something that's false online, people immediately come back with, no, that's not true because of this, because of that. The, it's, almost like, uh, it's almost like birds and they all start chirping together and it gets louder and louder because there's a conversation going on. Um, but it does seem to have a, a tremendously emotional basis. And I noticed this, like when we started PolitiFact in 2007, the, the sharing of news on Facebook was, was not a thing then. It was chain emails, which I'm sure a lot of people in the audience remember, these all caps emails, forward this to everyone you know, and it, and it would say something crazy, like the ACLU want a lawsuit to have all cross headstones taken out of military cemeteries, false. 
Um, <laughs> and, it, and, it would, and, it, and that's how it would spread. It would spread via email. It seems like that is the same spirit that we now see on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, I have a question for the, for the group, so Yaso, I want to bring you into this. Do you think that the spread of it, misinformation is kind of a human problem or a tech problem? Deb, you, you mentioned that there's, uh, you both mentioned that there's kind of an emotional <coughs> person-driven element to it. Um, and if it is, in, in fact, person-driven, are social media outlets responsible for the spread of information on the tech side, or are people, should people be held more responsible for um, fact-checking their own information as they're using these platforms? Tricky question. <laughs> so I think that there's no separation between human and tech anymore. Uh, when you roll out a platform like Facebook and, or WhatsApp in a country like the US, that is a big country, uh, or Brazil, like to, you have to think in the platform that you're rolling out and in the consequences because you're creating a new ecosystem. So. I believe that this separation is something that makes it difficult for us to deal with all these changes because then the governments are, let's just shut down WhatsApp. And then you're like, but there's Telegram. And they're like, shut down Telegram. And you're like, yeah, but then we have another app, like Signal. And they're like, shut down everything, no internet. So what are we going to do? We have to start to think as if these two things are the same. And so if we're not going to shut down the internet, because I think that's <laughs> generally a bad idea, yeah. um, what, what role do you think that these, uh, these social media companies, the, diff the leaders of the different apps, have in, in combating misinformation? How, how can they participate in the conversation instead of um, using <laughs> lights on or lights off? Yeah, I really think that we should. So I am a software developer and also a designer. And I'd love to talk with people from social sciences, anthropologists, because I think we have to understand how these things interplay. So for me, we have to talk more about social issues before launching, um, like getting all everyone in a platform and then saying, well, people are just using my platform. Uh, so I have one example. So in 2010, Facebook announced in the Mobile World Congress that they were making agreements with the tel teleco companies in the, the developing countries. And they, offered, they started to offer this um, smart, really cheap smartphones with the Facebook app already pre-installed and zero data, so no net, net neutrality. And then you have everyone using Facebook because it's like the internet. And then WhatsApp is in the package, which means that when you buy a phone in Brazil, you have access to WhatsApp and Facebook for free. You don't have to use your data. And then we have, because of a business model, like a strategy, we have a different ecosystem, like an ecosystem that is based in Facebook and WhatsApp. And then we have two different technologies playing, playing here, interplaying this, this ecosystem, which are the web, which is based in one protocol that was, think, that was taught by Tim Berners-Lee to share information and organize. And we have WhatsApp that is based in another different protocol that's meant to private conversations. Hmm. It's funny that you mentioned email because email has a dynamic very similar to WhatsApp and also uses a different protocol. So it's very interesting to think about the relationship of business models, social, responsibilities and technology, because they all interplay. I think over the past few years, we've definitely seen the major platforms uh, evolve in their thinking as to whether they were simple um, tools for their users or whether they are gatekeepers. I would argue that they are gatekeepers mm -hmm. on some level. And I think that they've started to acknowledge that they have that role too, because they've seen how their tools can be used for things that are harm people, for um, violence in some countries, um, for uh, election meddling in the United States. So I think that previously they just wanted to say, oh, we're just, we're neutral. We just let our users, you know, have their happy space. But now I think they see that it's not, it's not such a pretty picture out there on the internet and they're having to take steps. Um, I thought that um, the Alex Jones, uh, 
content being removed from some of the platforms was a very positive step. As a fact checker, though, I wished he would have been removed due to false content. He was actually removed on according for hate speech content, which is a little trickier on First Amendment grounds in the United States. I think he, you could have made a very strong case just to remove him for false content. What do you think the implications would have been if he would have been removed for false content? Well, I think it would have been a. I think it would have been much more of a warning to people who publish online to make sure that their facts are accurate. I mean, and this is, goes to my bias. I'm a fact checker, so I mean, we just see these routine. Uh, uh, people are putting information online, they don't care if it's accurate, there's no repercussions. Um, I think with hate speech, it, it, gets to be, um, it gets to be a trickier line for these companies to police. I think they would be better off on a factual basis. But, I mean, that's a, that's a debate we can have. I mean, at, at the end of the day, it was someone who was perpetuating this really inflammatory false content was, was uh, lost their platform. I'm, I'm really interested in that you mentioned Alex Jones. We have a lot of conversations about the decline in civil public discourse, and I think social media at its outset felt like a remedy to that. It felt like free conversation. It felt like a place where people could have dialogue and debate in public open spaces, and that was like a good thing. And it seems like now it's absorbed some of the more um, divisive, polarizing, toxic elements of um, society, and so these conversations that are currently happening on, on social media, what can we do to improve them? How do, how do we, you know, do we still see social media as a, as a remedy or a, as a place for public discourse, or is it a thing that, you know, we're approaching the level of having to abandon? I, I think Twitter is a place that it's really hard to have any kind of civil discourse on. And if you look at my Twitter feed, I don't respond much. I don't interact much. I find Twitter to be something of a toxic space for discussing politics, for being a journalist. Um, for being a woman. Um, there's all kinds of well-documented issues of bullying and harassment on Twitter. It's a really hard space to be in. Um, so uh, I think some people will leave those spaces um, if, if that's how they continue. Um, I think there's things that Twitter could do to improve its platform that they're not doing. And this has been a separate discussion among the fact checkers about is Twitter going to take any steps? Facebook has a, a fairly extensive program using third party fact checkers to try to reduce the spread of news, fake news on their platform. Um, but it's very difficult. Today, um, Sheryl Sandberg and Jack Dorsey are both giving testimony uh, in, in DC on what's going on inside each of their platforms. Um, Jack um, published his prepared remarks last night and um, references principles of healthy public discourse um, that actually came out of collaboration with the Media Lab and, and Cortico. Um, so I, I think it's an example of starting to define um, uh, beyond time on platform and all of the metrics that um, the social media platforms have relied on to figure out is the usage of the platform healthy from number of people and level of engagement to what's the nature, what's the quality of the, the discourse happening. So I think there's um, uh, real work underway to think about um, second bottom line, if you will, for what you're optimizing for, but I think the, the scale of these networks um, are beyond what any individual designer was able to contemplate. So what happens when you build a, a platform and then hydrate with millions, if not billions of people and create all sorts of um, feedback loops, that there's a, um, <coughs> a lot of new experiments, frankly, that um, are underway. Um, it's not like there's some deliberate design that um, w w anticipated all the, um, the dynamics. Uh, I also think um, creating new networks and experimenting with new design affordances. You know, you, you mentioned that you, you do work in, in software design. I was just thinking about um, building atop of the affordance of the internet, which tends to make it easy, not just uh, to not know whether, uh, you know, on the internet, they don't know you're a dog, said the famous cartoon. They also don't know where you're from. There's various affordance of the internet that I think, uh, um, detach us from our local and kind of human roots in some ways in order to allow us to 
um, uh, communicate at a distance, um, which is coming back to, to bite us. And a lot of the way that we build up networks of trust and, and what truths, it's, I think, uh, in addition to is something true or false, and, and we also are in our research rely on fact checking, so it's so important to, to know the difference between true and false. But almost orthogonal to veracity um, is what is um, the source you're going to trust? And I think it's sometimes a mistake to assume, well, you trust whatever is true. It's, it's not that simple. There's a question of what are the values of the source of information. If the values are not aligned, I don't care if it's true, I'm, not, I'm gonna ignore it. Uh, and I think one of the things we're seeing with the internet and with a lot of the social um, networks is it's much easier for us to um, self-separate, self-sort and segregate into uh, disconnected um, uh, networks and then separate from true and false is are we even talking about the same things? I wanna, I wanna have, have our other panelists jump in on that point right before we take one question from the audience. How, if, if um, there is a conversation between true and false but also the alignment of personal values, how does one go about determining what is true from a, from a fact perspective, from a global perspective, how, do, how are we thinking about that? So I think we are in the beginning of setting up our places in the virtual world and to play with the real world. So I think that we are building the public spaces, the private spaces, the places where we want to talk with our family, places where we can talk to our community, and then we are trying to understand what are those places and who can we trust in each of them. And at the same time, we're living in times where no one trusts the government, the institutions, like the news uh, outlets. So we have to rebuild everything from the bottom and try to um, design in a better way without separating us, like having multiple disciplines and researchers and the, the market to talk among themselves to come up with better solutions, I think. Angie? Yeah, I do think that truth and civility um, go hand in hand, but they're not the same thing. Um, but I think that some of the most vicious and hateful things that we see on the internet often is like factually inaccurate. So um, I think we need to put more of an emphasis on accuracy, facts, evidence, and, um, and then I think some better civility will follow. Absolutely. We have one question in the audience. Yeah, hi, uh, Rand Barthel from, uh, <clears throat> I work for IBM, uh, and I wonder, uh, instead of kind of viewing the kind of policing of content as a responsibility of the social media companies like the Facebooks of the world, which would be an impossible burden for them really, uh, they can't possibly hire enough fact checkers to keep up, up with everything that goes on their platform. Uh, it, are they working on ways to kind of give us some help or some aids in terms of, of uh, you know, uh, indexes perhaps uh, that can give us a, kind of an indication of if we go into a particular source or, or look at a particular source, what is the likelihood, what's the relative likelihood that we would find believable material in there or material that is, that is you know, what's the level of toxicity we're likely to encounter in there? You know, that we could perhaps tailor with some kind of indications of what sort of base sources of information we regard as reliable, like, like, like you know, do you, do you, are you more inclined to believe Breitbart or the New York Times, that, you know, that kind of thing, uh, where we could kind of get some help with features that don't, that aren't prescriptive or dictatorial, but are kind of there for our use. Yeah, I'm not advocating um, policing by any means. I'm definitely um, a huge First Amendment fan. I guess what I'm arguing for are minimum standards because I think that um, I think those of us who are not in the tech community and have looked at it from the outside have just thought, oh, well, it must be too complicated for them to do anything about. Um, but the things that I've seen over the past several years, especially with our work on Facebook, um, fact checkers have been working with Google um, to put coding into fact checking results. There are things they can do. And I, I think that as consumers, we should just have certain minimum standards around the platforms and the content that they, they permit to be on their platforms. Yeah. Um, 
And I, I, I agree with that. And I, but I think it's, it's that and there are uh, technical possibilities, and I think a lot of them are being explored. I don't think the platforms openly discuss what they're doing I internally in terms of different behavioral signals and ways to um, uh, score and rank sources based on past behavior and performance, uh, including, you know, if a source keeps getting dinged by PolitiFact, well, one can track that and the history of that source, then, you know, that becomes an input. Um, if people are um, uh, uh, flagging a source or a piece of content as problematic, and then, you know, the, the manual checks that happen within the platforms confirm, yeah, this, this was flagged for good reason, all of those can be accumulated. They are um, they, they do keep track of these things. Um, to what degree the platform then uses those signals, either to make decisions of what end user ends up seeing, or to what degree you try to put control into the hands of users. I mean, most people don't really want a thousand uh, knobs to adjust for, you know, um, what, what version of fake news do I like and not like. Um, you know, <laughs> yes, everyone will agree, I don't want to be fooled, but beyond that, um, it, it may be a fact, but not a fact that I care about, or I don't trust why you're trying to bring that fact to my attention. Now we get into uh, a realm where fact-checking doesn't help us. It's like, well, uh, how are you gonna resolve who's right and who's wrong about which facts I should, you know, life is short, which one should I pay attention to? So um, there's a lot of tricky um, questions there that I, I, I think go back to the end, to us as users of the platform of what we choose, choose to do with them. Also, I think that the media has some part in it. Uh, so for example, we have the Comprovo project, which is part of the project that I'm working on at Children's Science Center. And um, we have more than 25 news outlets doing verification that we receive from the users. They send us through our WhatsApp business number and then we verify and we give them back by publishing more than 25 platforms, like news uh, outlets in Brazil. So the media has also to agree with some standards, with some things. Abs like absolutely, you know, in, uh, and we just heard from Bridget Mendler, who, you know, on Twitter and Facebook is uh, a, a media presence because of her reach. Um, she's somewhat unique in that she's thinking about what is the health of the conversations that my own tweets are triggering, and are there ways that I can think about not just optimizing for the size of my reach and the number of people who are uh, um, uh, reacting, but what's the health and what's the richness of that conversation? Um, if we look at how a lot of media are actually behaving today, um, one might say that um, to divide and enrage the audience is a, turning out to be a great business model. Polarization is a great business model. Les Moonves, who the, runs the biggest television network in America, CBS, um, in the primaries in 2016 was asked, what do you think of the rise of Donald Trump in the primaries? And his answer was, uh, I think it's bad for the country, but great for business. So if our, our media um, corporations are actually um, benefiting from a more and more, you know, if, if an enraged audience is a form of engaged audience and you can efficiently sell engagement, and if the advertisers don't care what the quality of the engagement is, they just get the eyeballs, um, then you have this system that is actually overall benefiting, and uh, the, pl the platforms certainly are playing a role, the distribution platforms, uh, but absolutely the media entities are, are uh, in the thick of it. Um, so it's a, uh, it's a very, multi-dimensional uh, entangled <laughs> mess. <laughs> it's complicated, the final answer. <laughs> well, Deb, Yasadora, Angie, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.